what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to turn this, and you're going to be able to see my notes, unfortunately, <laughs> but you're also going <laughs> to be able to see the slide <laughs> because I don't think you can see it very well from here. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to my talk. There are so many of you. I really appreciate this. I heard one of you was like in line for a while. Um, that makes my stomach hurt and makes me want to cry because it's extremely <laughs> sweet and uh, I hope <laughs> that I make this worth your time. Um, so yeah, today I'm talking about costuming a character's narrative arc. Uh, and so the first question to ask is what does that even mean? Um, so in writing, there's a couple ways that the word arc is used. Uh, so there's the character arc, which is generally an internal thing. So it's stuff that's happening kind of within the character themselves but that changes the, the trajectory of the story and themselves within it. Um, so a really good example of this is like Walter White in Breaking Bad. I'm going to make some references to shows and films, and it's going to kill me, but I feel like there's some of them that you're not going to know, and I'm going to have to kind of like go over them. But I assume everybody knows about Walter White from Breaking Bad. Um, he starts as like a, you know, kind of goofy teacher guy, and by the end, he's just like the worst human being that's ever lived. He watches a girl like die and does nothing about it. So miserable guy. Um, and then there's the overall story arc, which is the external events that are happening in the story that impact everything. And both of these things usually exist in you know, all forms of media. Um, a good example of like a pretty obvious story arc, and one that I'm going to talk <laughs> about a lot today, is in Lord of the Rings, uh, moving the ring to Mordor. And the, the impact of the ring is the overall story arc. Um, <sighs> let's take a deep breath. I'm nervous. <laughs> um, this is so I did these slides, and then afterwards I was like, I feel like there's going to be a lot of younger people here who maybe haven't seen E.T., so this is going to hurt me in my heart, I think. <laughs> but I'm going to ask you, and be honest, how many of you have not seen the movie E.T.? There's not that many of you. There's l Okay, you know, we're good. <laughs> Everyone, I can breathe a little bit easier. So E.T. is a 1982 Steven Spielberg movie, and it stars Drew Barrymore, and that's the dad from The Haunting of Hill House, so that's Elliot. Uh, and this alien, E.T., the extraterrestrial, uh, is a baby alien who gets left behind by his parents. And he forms a bond with Elliot um, that is, they can like feel each other's feelings. And when one of them gets hurt, the other gets hurt. It's very sweet. It's like, so, E.T. so ugly. Look at him. Like, it's hard not to, it's hard not to love him. So this is actually like kind of their core costumes and how they appear. He has this like glowing heart. His finger glows when he does the <laughs> E.T. It's very cute. Um, this is so hard to see. Can we turn lights off? Is that possible? So people can, because the color is kind of important here. Um, is there light somewhere we can turn off? Maybe. Okay, thank you. Can you all see this better now? Okay, good. I'm sorry, camera, that you're not going to be able to see me very well, but that's ideal for me. Um, <laughs> so this is when Elliot meets E.T. He's got this, like, puffy red jacket on, um, but you can kind of compare it to that costume that I already said was his like hero costume it's not very saturated it also is quite big on him like it, it's not form-fitting um, and then as he gets to know E.T. there's a scene god it's so hard to see I hate these screen things but uh, there's a scene where he you know E.T. comes and stays in his house he's hiding him in his closet uh, and he tells his mommy sick so he can stay home and he wears this little like um, like long john underwear pajamas and you can kind of see that like his shapes now, like the shape of his body is kind of, it's quite similar to E.T. He's a very little guy. And it really helps like as a viewer, you really associate these two things as they're both little kids. Like, and it helps kind of emphasize that like E.T. is not just a little alien. He's like, he's like a child. And that's not just being done in the costume, very much being done in the plot as well. But the costume kind of helps um, drive this as well and helps sort of reinforce it. This is that I seen E.T. when he <laughs> touches the finger. Uh, so there's always this like red glow that's coming off of E.T. when he does this thing. And Elliot's costuming here is this like, you know, you've got this bright red uh, on the t-shirt underneath and you've got this like kind of red and white uh, flannel. And so you're getting a lot of bounce that's coming off that in that scene, um, but not a lot. Like you're getting a lot of saturation pops and stuff off of it. But the, the fact that it's got the white as well, like you're not getting as much, it's not super intense. Um, the military takes E.T. And they do like, <laughs> uh, I'm spoiling E.T. for you. I'm sorry. Um, but they do uh, studies on him. 
uh, to understand the connection between them, and it harms Elliot and it harms E.T. And they were in the exact same <laughs> little outfit. It's just like a blanket. Uh, but if you were to put Elliot in any other costume, if you were to put like a T-shirt on him or anything else, you wouldn't get that level of parody of like these these characters are connected, like in in an irre like irreversible way. They take him out of the hospital. They break out. This is where, at some point, he gets a costume change. I don't even remember <laughs> where he puts this sweater on, but he puts on his iconic red sweater. This is the hero costume of the entire movie, and it's the one that is most associated with it. So you see him on the bike with E.T.'s in the little basket, and they, like, fly. It's really cute. Um, and so E.T.'s still got that, like, it's actually almost the same material as that um, long john that he has on in the scene where they first start to connect, which I think is a nice little, it's a nice little touch. And then this is, to me, one of the most beautiful pieces of costuming in film is um, you've had all this lead up to this moment, and this is uh, where E.T.'s family comes to get him. Like, Elliot brings him, with, uh, his brother and some friends back to the place where they found him, and his family has come to get him. And uh, E.T.'s little heart is glowing red, and you're getting that, like, uh, I'm going to walk to this side. You're getting the bounce light, fr or the, the direct light from that is hitting the underside of E.T.'s face. And then he's also got red under his face, but that's not coming from the light over here. It's the bounce light hitting this sweater and coming up and uh, hitting underneath his chin. So you're getting this beautiful parody that really helps sell that like these characters, even though E.T.'s about to leave and go home, they're bonded and connected forever. And if this costume, if this sweater was blue or yellow or white or anything, it would not have this impact. You wouldn't get this image uh, in the end, which you can look at this image as a still and feel the emotion from it. Um, and so it's not like, that's again, not the only thing <laughs> that drove the, this vibe and this plot, but it's such an important, subtle thing that's added to it that really kind of sells this um, beautiful moment. I love E.T. <laughs> I also love this movie. I'm not even gonna ask, because it'll hurt me too much if any of you haven't seen this, but it's of the, the original and the Chris Pat Pratt JPU was this one, and he wasn't in it. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're introduced to Dr. Ian Malcolm. He's wearing a, uh, sorry, I got too preoccupied with whether or not you've seen Jurassic Park. Um, that was a very character-centric arc. Obviously, the, the external narrative is still part of it, but we're seeing the internal effects of these characters through their costuming. Um, this one is very external. So uh, we first introduced a Dr. Ian Malcolm. It's this guy. Uh, he's got his like rock star scientist look on. He's wearing like a black leather jacket and those black pants. He's all in black. He's got some like he's got like a necklace and a ring and stuff on that kind of adds a little bit of spec and kind of adds to the rock star <laughs> rock star vibe of 1993. Um, as the story progresses, this story takes place in the course of two days. It's really just one one full day. Um, and so they're on this like journey and to show the passage of time, they're not gonna like change costumes. It doesn't make any sense. It would break the narrative flow to make them change costumes um, entirely. They start to change the existing costume. So he takes his jacket off by this point, um, which makes sense. They're the they've been on this journey now for like a few hours. They're notably bored, they talk about that, and it's hot. They're in a jungle. So he strips off a piece of the costume. This is a costume change. Um, it's a very iconic scene, probably the you know main scene that you think of in this movie. The rain has impacted the costume. It's added specularity to it, and it's created a different feel than up here. So even though they've literally not changed anything but made it wet, this is still a costume change. And it does that specularity of the rain. If it was not raining for that scene, it wouldn't quite have the same impact. Him in all black, and this is not why they chose to do this. There's a lot of reasons why they would have chosen to do this, and they all work together, but him in all black would be completely lost in a lot of this environment, but you get that really nice like specularity all along here and like along all of the costume. Uh, and they use that a lot in um, older films really successfully. And then of course, <laughs> his final costume change. So really all that's happened with this character John pointed out, and I do have to, I told him I wasn't going to say this, but I do think it's really cool. He's in that, like, David God repose state. And he did say earlier that, like, um, you know, they're defying God by doing this. I thought it was really fucking cool. <laughs> like, I didn't, I was like, I'm not going to say that's not about the costume. But now that I look at it again, I'm like, yeah, John, you're right. That is cool. Uh, but, yeah, they do, like, a, 
like a costume change just by opening his shirt. So like this guy's costume has changed a bunch, but it's literally just taking stuff off. And it does have that same impact though. Like you're seeing the effects of the environment, you're seeing the effects of, you know, the plot playing on him and you're understanding this happened over the course of a couple days and a lot of shit has <laughs> happened to him and the other characters. Um, so very like external. Okay, so I talk a lot about films and uh, I am gonna talk about Lord of the Rings more and none of those are games. And so there is, you know, why do I talk about this as a game person? Um, the games that I've worked on, Last of Us and Uncharted, are very character narrative driven. So they're a lot about these characters um, in the story. And um, we adopted, Ashley actually started uh, kind of a Hollywood pipeline for costuming where we scan everything, like we sourced real costumes and we would scan them. And so our pipeline was a lot closer to Hollywood pipelines than it would have been to say like, it's probably the most opposite to Riot. Like Riot's character design is the opposite end of the spectrum. It's very much like about game design first, like seeing them in the space and having to read the characters very immediately because it's a competitive top-down game. Um, ours is about like getting into the minds of the characters. So that that is a major similarity. It's why we worked this way. Um, there are differences though. Like games, by their very nature, they move a lot during production. Like things, it's not as straightforward as like we get a script and like, okay, let's like plot out these costumes. During production, gameplay starts to come in and suddenly it's like, oh, this whole sequence, uh, we can't do it now. <laughs> or like this whole character, we're not gonna do it now. Um, there's technical constraints, like with clothing, we get constraints on like how, how like this, never. Like <laughs> this sort of thing is a fucking nightmare in a game. Like, uh, so stuff like that has to come into play. Um, a as well as just like they're living fluid things. There's a lot that goes into to game design. And so for that reason, we do tend to go a little bit like point to point, like you don't have the ability to like plot out the entire arc to begin with. You do have to kind of like go for it um, kind of on a one to one and you have to change a lot. Like you have to be willing to be like, okay, the like gameplay is completely changing. So now this like amazing idea I had, that's like the best idea for ever, like any costume ever, like I have to change it, unfortunately. Um, so we'll talk about uh, a game, obviously, <laughs> that I worked on. And if you've seen the course that I've done, I, d I do the same bit. I think this is one of the only things that has crossover, but um, it's the game that I worked the most on for costumes, <laughs> so it's the one that I can talk about the most. And character art direction was Ashley Sadowski, who's back there, and then general art direction was John Sweeney, so he did environment art direction. Um, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> give them a <laughs> round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, because it embarrasses them. And now I'm not the only one with an upset tummy. So, <laughs> uh, so Ellie's arc throughout the entirety of the series from Tilu 1 through the Left Behind into Last of Us 2 um, follows a very filmic arc. It's the exact same as um, the one that we talked about. It's very impacted by her character growth. It's impacted by the change of time. Uh, and it's also impacted by the environmental stuff that's happening around her. So this is her uh, original Tilu 1 hero look. Um, She's a kid here, she's 13. She's got that red shirt on that has the palm tree graphic, jeans, chucks. She's a teen. She's a teen in tw 2013. Um, as we move through the story, this is her uh, costume from Tilu 2. Uh, she, you know, you see her kind of grow and change. Like she's still a teenager, but you're seeing that like development over time. This shirt is very, very similar to the shirt that her girlfriend who dies, I'm gonna spoil The Last of Us as well, I'm sorry, <laughs> and Left Behind. It's a very old game at this point, so I'm gonna, I'm sorry. Um, her girlfriend in Left Behind dies and she wears a very similar shirt. So to me, um, this sort of signifies early on Ellie's inability to kind of let go of things and that she gets very, these at attachments to the people that she's lost and she has a hard time, um, as we all would. <laughs> with watching our loved ones die. <laughs> um, and so you see her in this costume a lot. This is like her hero look for Last of Us 2. And she wears a, s that, it's like a similar look with the addition of a jacket at some points uh, in Seattle. Um, and by the time she spit out of Seattle, even though she's wearing that same outfit for, what is it, like six days? <laughs> five days, six days, I don't remember. Um, she comes at the end of it like that, like the mud girl from the uh, mobile ads. Like she's just <laughs> caked in mud and she's got blood all over and she's disgusting. And it shows like not only the passage of time, 
It shows the weather <laughs> that had taken place in that time. And it also shows her mental descent. Like, she doesn't give a shit. She's just, like, on this tear to get Abby. I feel like I'm getting so... I'm going to pull this away from my mouth a bit. Is it, like, making weird noises? I'm sorry. Um, this is the scene where she says goodbye to Dina, my least favorite scene. What a terrible choice she made. Um, and she's in Joel's jacket here. Uh, and it's oversized. It doesn't fit her, which kind of indicates that she's very in over her head. But it again is she can't get over things like she's she's got these attachment issues and she gets very fixated on on the, this like vengeance quest of hers. And so it's again very similar to uh, the choice to put that costume on her is to have her wearing Joel's jacket on this vengeance quest where she just gives up everything important to her to, to go do this useless, pointless thing. Um, I love this costume. This is her Santa Barbara look. Uh, she goes into Santa Barbara completely unhinged, guns blazing. She's got a machine gun at this point. I think it's the first time that we have Ellie with a machine gun. But what I love about the costume is it mirrors the first one. So she's got the blood coming down the sleeves. Uh, it looks very similar to the red T-shirt of the first one. She's in Santa Barbara. She's surrounded by palm trees, and it's the first time she sees palm trees, which she's loved since the first game. She said it was a goal of hers. Um, and so to me, this is a beautiful way to make us as, as the viewers watch her do these things that we know are unhinged and we feel for this character who we grew to love as we watch her lose her humanity. Um, and it's just this very subtle reminder of like th she was that and she's not that anymore. Like now she's about as far from that as we can get. But we put this like hint of who she used to be, this like memory of who she used to be is always there to remind us really. This is her final costume. Uh, she's again in a Joel shirt. Um, and to me, this kind of just showed that she became him in the end. Like, that um, violence was very cyclical in this world, and it just doesn't end. Like, the, that thing that he was, which was monstrous, she, yeah, turned into on her way to avenge him. These are just a handful. There are endless costume and hair changes for Ellie. And these also, like, there was also hundreds of them for the other characters as well. And some of those changes were literally just time-based. Like, you know, we have to show the passage of time. It doesn't make sense to have them be in the same costume. It creates like the, like a Bart Simpson effect if they're just in the same costume all the time. You don't get a sense of the change. Um, but these are ones that to me stood out as being kind of these pivotal costumes that helped define her arc. Like they helped us as viewers uh, like kind of move through that story with her and, and see those changes. So now let's get into a little bit of the practical application because that was all heavily theoretical. So like how do you take all of that stuff that I just talked about and like as a designer start to work that into your own process? Um, and I don't know how other people do it, but <laughs> I'm going to tell you how I do it. Um, so this is very, all of this is very much driven by like how I work and even those interpretations those are my interpretations like you could talk to any of those filmmakers you could talk to the rest of the team at Naughty Dog and ask them like was that the intent and they might say no but that's irrelevant because a part of our job is to create costumes that resonate with people so that they can read what they want out of it they can take what they want from it and as designers we sort of look at those costumes and try to break that down like how what were they thinking during all of this um, and whether we get it right or not doesn't matter. We just take that same knowledge and approach into our own costuming. Um, so that's my approach to it anyway. I might have to read off my slides for this one because I have a lot of stuff written down for this. So in my schoolism course, uh, I covered designing hero costumes for this is Goldberry and Tom Bombadil. Um, have any of you read The Lord of the Rings? <laughs> Okay, a lot of you have read The Lord of the Rings. That's good. Um, they have a bit part in The Lord of the Rings book for the rest of you. Um, they appear for like two chapters. He saves the hobbits' lives um, or twice. Yeah, he saves them first from a tree that's trying to eat them and then later on this spooky Barrow Downs place. Um, but they, it makes sense that they cut them from the movie. Like it's just a big chunk of like they're mostly singing. It's really weird. Like they're kind of boring. Like, the first time I read it, I was like, oh, my God, I hate this. Like, these people are so boring. Um, and then I got really into The Lord of the Rings, <laughs> and I started reading more about them, and I was just really fascinated with them. Like, um, they're he's not affected by the ring, so he can put the ring on, he can hold it, and nothing happens to him. 
uh, he was one of the first beings on Middle Earth. So he preceded everybody else on Middle Earth. So he's not really a human, but he's also not a god. And according to Tolkien, he's the embodiment of the English countryside. She's the daughter of the river. So they describe these costumes very clearly uh, in the book, but it's really all they describe about them and then they do some songs and stuff. Um, so these are their hero costumes that I designed, but in my mind, the etern these eternal beings who like pre-cluded, like they pre-existed for like hobbits and humans and everything, I don't think they're gonna look like people necessarily, like it's a weird choice to make them look like people. So I thought that maybe this was like a glamour that they appeared to the hobbits and other people as, but then they have this like cryptid form that they appear to each other as. Uh, and both of these are based off of um, myths from the UK. So this is based off Jenny Greenteeth, uh, who is like a river spirit. Um, and that's the uh, tree man or the apple man, who is a very popular um, British myth. And so uh, this could also be considered a hero costume. And in the course, I go over the choices and why I designed them, both of those images. Um, but I didn't really get into an arc with the class because they don't have one. Uh, they, again, they exist for a chapter. So for this, I just decided to make one up. Um, so I told you already that Tom rescues the hobbits, uh, first from the tree and then from the, um, these, well, I'm just going to show you, these like ghouls that live in this place called the Baron. This is a picture. This is not, again, they cut all this. So this is just an image I found on Google, but, um, they describe it as this like hilly area. And on top of all the hills are these crypts where these scary ghouls live. I actually think it'd be sick if they put this in the movie, but whatever. Uh, and the, they're told explicitly by Tom, don't, you know, don't go up there, don't touch them. And of course they're hobbits and they're kind of dumb in the movies or in the books. So they like go up there and, uh, they get attacked and held in a crypt by ghoulies and Tom, um, goes to rescue them. So for the, these purposes, just to be able to explore some stuff with it, I decided to switch that and make it so Goldberry goes and rescues them. And again, this is something that like in production, you're not gonna be asked to like write story moments necessarily, although sometimes like we were very involved in the narrative. Um, this is more like, I made this up as like, this was the prompt that I was given like by a potential director, like make it so Goldberry's the one that saves um, the hobbits. And so then this next up would be like what I would do with that um, prompt. Also, he rides a horse um, to, to save them. So like I designed a horse for it because there's no world in which I don't like design a horse when that's an option. Um, so before anything else, I start with questions. I ask myself some questions. I've already designed this costume and this is the one that in my mind is a hero costume. Like if you were to make a Tom Bombadil Goldberry game, she, this would be the costume she'd be wearing on the cover. Like it's the one that she's defined by. Um, so why would I do the costume change? It's the very first question. Why does this need a costume change? So she's about to travel to this very cold and desolate place um, where she's going to f like face these sort of scary and um, dangerous enemies. Um, so I wanted it to feel a little bit moodier. I wanted heavier fabrics to help kind of sell that, you know, it's going to be colder. She's going to be wearing this light airy thing with like no shoes. That's a little bit ridiculous. Um, and I wanted it to match kind of the vibe of it. Like this doesn't quite match like the, the feeling that you would want from something more somber and a little bit more like, you know, dangerous. Um, and then there's also like, okay, so those are the differences that I want, but how do you take some of these like established things and is there a way to work any of that into the next costume? Like, I don't want to just do a full change where it's like nothing is, I mean, you could, you could do something completely different where it's like uh, it out of left field. That does say something though. So it's like in a story like The Lord of the Rings, that has hundreds of characters spanning over not just the three books, but there's the Hobbits and then there's Cimmer Cimmerillion, <laughs> like the other the other books that have um, characters in them. Uh, in a lot of the um, Lord of the Rings uh, stuff, they actually tend to maintain like pretty tight looks for their for their characters. Like good example, of this is Gandalf. So he's Gandalf the Gray, and he wears gray, and then he's Gandalf the white and he wears white like it's <laughs> very <laughs> straightforward costuming um, but even the hobbits they have more variety like you see a lot more variety in them they tend to maintain pretty tight like color palettes and stuff like that like these is obviously the original trilogy they've got like these earthy rusty colors a lot of green like just sort of neutrals 
uh, Bilbo, it's sort of the exact same palette as um, Frodo, but he adds this like bright uh, purpley jacket. And then this is from the show, which I know some of you hate. Every a lot of people like uh, on the fence about this. I kind of love it, but um, and this like the kind of main Hobbit. She sometimes wears this green, but then she also sometimes wears one that looks kind of like this color if you like really lightened it up and desaturated it. So they maintain a really tight like sort of overall aesthetic for these. Um, for their characters. So that was a thing I considered. I'm not gonna just out of left field with this next costume. Um, I decided to maintain the color, so but I darkened it. I wanted it to feel a little bit more somber. I changed the material to velvet. Uh, it's heavier. Um, it helps with that thing that I was saying. I wanted to feel like, you know, she's going into a cold place. I want it to feel a little bit warmer. Um, it also has specularity. So she's going into that, uh, I talked about the Ian Malcolm costume that had the uh, sort of the specularity when it rained. She's going to this misty, foggy place. And so there's not a lot of light there. So the velvet is going to pick up a bit of sheen and it's going to add, you know, some, in some visual interest. Um, let me make sure. Oh yeah, so I th the embellishments. Like on the first costume, I had this like gold chain, which is described in the book. That feels a little bit too impractical. Um, so I took the gold chain off and I opted instead for in, um, removing the silver embroidery and putting that gold embroidery on this front panel. Um, so just making things like that to try to like, okay, what do I like from this that feels very like her and how do I pull it into this, change it, um, and still make it feel like, you know, what I need it to feel like. I also like, there's a world where you say, okay, this still is a little bit impractical for going to, you know, the Barrow Dance and Saving Things. She's not a very practical lady. She, this is her house outfit. So like, um, Tom is this very humble, very practical dude who's like, you know, always seems to be always wearing the same thing. He's just sort of rolling around the countryside, saving people. She's much more like ethereal in the descriptions of her. Um, and she's much more like opulent. Um, she is an immortal god, like not god, she's like a cryptid, I guess. I don't know what to describe her as, but she uh, is the daughter of the river, this powerful, uh, you know, larger spirit. Um, and so it makes sense to maintain that like sense of royalty in her to me. It didn't make sense to put her in something like rough linen or, or wool or any of the other things that the other um, entities of the world or, and beings of the world are wearing. Um, so you have to kind of toe that line of like, I want practicality. I gave her practical shoes. That was my, cause like she had no shoes on before. So I was like, girl, you gotta like put shoes on if you're gonna go out into the wood, into the Barrow Downs. Um, let me just make sure I got everything. Yes, oh yeah, and then the long flowing cape and the dress, um, they just sort of add to the drama of the whole thing. Like, you know, again, she's rolling out to save them. It just adds to that sort of um, the dramatics of it all. Uh, and in the schoolism course, I talked about how I designed their embroidery um, to sort of support each other. So she's the uh, daughter of the river, so he has water embroidery on him, and she's got the leaf motif on her, so they're representing each other as their two elements in balance. They're the, the countryside and the, and the river together um, in balance. However, when she leaves the comfort of their home and goes out to save these hobbits, she is alone the daughter of the river. So she is going on her own and I wanted to represent that solo power, like that she's no longer with him and, and she can do this you know, separate of him. And she's going into a place filled with danger <laughs> and enemies. And I wanted that represented. I wanted it to feel like this is just her. Um, so my original intent, I figured I would do that with the embroidery um, because that's how I had done it previously. So my original intent was to like put these lily pads that were like, you know, to a top down view of lily pads, like flowing down the hem of the dress and then kind of coming up the back, like a sort of inverted T shape. Um, and yeah, so I, you know, I ended up, I talk a little bit later about how I shifted that a little bit. Um, and then also she's on a water horse. This is a Kelpie. It is another, um, uh, it's a Scottish cryptid, um, no, thought to haunt locks and stuff like that. So I took another cryptid and made that her horse because that's like, I mean, obviously I was gonna paint a Kelpie and <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, the power of the river is fully behind her on this journey. She's got the, the Kelpie, she's got like everything about her is representing like, I'm doing this on my own. I'm the, the, you know, going to save these hobbits. This creates a shift in mood. So it's not no longer the lighthearted, like, oh, she's at home with her doting husband. Now she's on a mission. Um, and it's 
that creates the need to, you know, change up the, the costume and make all of that stuff apparent or as apparent as possible. Because you don't have to be on the nose about it or anything, but you just, that is my whole reasoning behind shifting this costume and not just keeping her in the thing she was in. Um, yeah, and also it doesn't just show a passage of time. It shows a pivotal shift in the trajectory of not just this character, but the story because she does save the hobbits um, or in the book, he saves the hobbits, but you know what I mean. Um, so this, I think, yeah, hopefully it doesn't pause because sometimes these pause on me, which is annoying. So I do get in the painting process a lot in the schoolism course. I did want to cover a little bit of it here because I do think some of this stuff is relevant to, to this process that I'm talking about. Um, so the way that I do multiple costumes is what I call the paper doll method where I just take what I've already done and I just duplicate it. I've painted the face. I've painted all the hands. I don't need to do that again. Like it's done. That's wasted time. Um, so I just duplicate it and I draw right on top of that what I want the next costume to be. Um, and then you can see that like kind of all around the, the piece is my reference. This is actually one that I used quite a bit. It's a riding habit from the 18th century. And so that paneling on the front is the paneling that I ended up using. Uh, I have a lot of velvet references all over the place. Uh, I use that for the, I use it directly for the velvet reference. Um, I keep my reference all around me all the time um, because like if out of sight out of mind for me like if it's on my hard drive somewhere I'm not looking at it like it has to be like on the screen for me to use it it also helps with flow like I'm not constantly shifting back and forth from like Photoshop to like looking for reference I've like I've got it I've pre-gathered it and it's here ready for me um, also another little fun trick I wanted it green still so I just took the green dress and I like darkened it up and then I just used that as my painting base like I will reuse work until I can't like I will try to reuse it even when it's somewhat impractical for me to reuse it because it's just you know production pipelines make it so that you, you that they don't care like how you know if you spent they actually do care if you spent too much time on it they're like what are you doing like please please speed this process up and what this allows me is I can then iterate a ton of times like I only did this one because I knew what I was, it's like, I'm not sh pitching it to someone. I knew I, I knew what I wanted it to be. But if I was pitching this to a team, i just do a bunch of them. Like, I would just, you know, copy it out, do another one. Um, and so it's a time-saving thing, and it enables you to focus on the thing that matters, because what matters here is the costume. And she's just, like, kind of a coat hanger at this point for the costume. Like, but you, you want to focus on getting the fit and everything of the costume correct. Um... Environment's also a consideration. So I showed you already the picture. They're going to this like foggy place and it tends to be very, very desaturated, almost gray. So this is uh, just color picked from the uh, first costume and this is from the second one. And they're both good choices. I would probably pitch both of them, honestly. But this feels more somber to me and you can imagine it with the velvet sheen, it's going to really, you know, kind of feel the way that I want it to feel against this environment. This one tends to be a little bit cheerier. And the other thing that I was considering is like, how is this character going to be revealed? So in the scene, like, how's the scene going to play out? If she rides up and sort of appears out of the mist and she kind of blends into it at first because she's on this, like, dark horse with this dark dress, and then as she emerges from the mist, you see who it is, there's something compelling about that versus if you see her from a mile away in, like, an apple green um, color. And I will say that neither of those solutions is wrong. Like, and there's a world where, again, I would pitch both of them. I do incorporate some of that green into the rest of her costume. Like, the um, cloak is quite light. Um, and then I'm also going to later I add in, like, a this under piece, which I stole from one of these. I don't remember. But I think, like, one of the, like, see, it's got, like, color underneath it that's different. I liked that a lot. So I was, like, I'm stealing that. Um, I did, oh, by the way, these references, I bought all of them. So <laughs> I mentioned that in my, uh, in my um, course. When I use reference, I'm sourcing it, like, ethically. I'm not going to take somebody's art that, like, someone's photography art and use it directly. I will sometimes look at that stuff because there's sometimes information where I'm not taking the entire thing from it. I'm just like, oh, it's got nice specularity, so I'll look at it. But all these I bought, this is ancient, so, you know, th there's no one to buy that one from. But these are all from a reference pack uh, that I purchased, so there's no issue in me using it. Um, I do also, you can see me messing around a lot with the back of the cape. That was another thing that I was thinking about a lot. Like, did I want it to just disappear into black back there, which is kind of compelling? Or did I want it to really pop out against the back? And again, those are things that I would, I would just try both of them and I would pitch both of them. 
Um, I will say if I was going to go to black back there to make it really dark, I would delete out the whole cape and pitch the costumes next to each other with and without the cape because readability for the team is still crucial, even at this stage where I'm just kind of like still sort of loosely figuring it out. Let me make sure that I got everything. Yes. Okay. Um, so I also spend play. No. How do I go back? Yes. There we go. Maybe. Um, I look a lot. I'm going to cross over again. Sorry. I look a lot at the piping detailing. So like this sort of stuff and the belts and all that. The stitching. Like you see how the stitching on velvet like does something. It like there's a. <laughs> I'm going to use my words here. I'm going to learn how to use my art words. Um, there's like a little bit of a like a sheen for the stitching. It's because the material is like really heavy and it's again got that specularity on it. I look at that a lot also for adding in the detailing of the. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> everyone's awake now. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm not gonna do that ever again. Um, uh, <laughs> where was I? Also with the detail. <laughs> Just give me a second. Okay, the detailing on the front paneling, the gold, the gold stuff. I've been looking at like references that are floating around on the screen, and then I don't. You can look, see this very close. This is very loose. Like it's very roughly indicated in there. At this stage, which I would consider the pitch stage, you don't need this to be super tight. Like you just need it to, to do the thing. You need them to be able to look at it and be like, yeah, it's like stitching. I got it. By the time you get into like actual production, then you need to start to get tighter with this. And so if this costume were approved, if they're like, yeah, we love it, um, I would then this, I would make this. Like I would make a texture. This is what I would do at Naughty Dog. I'd make a flat texture and I'd give it to the character team that would was tileable and that showed them exactly what um, I wanted that to be. Uh, same as this. And then all of the like detail about the dress, we would provide that for them with call out. So what is this material? Because that's not velvet. It's like a some sort of like linen-y material. I would give them a reference for that. I'd give them a photo reference for the, I'd probably just give them all the references I've been using, honestly. Close up reference of what this, t this um, the stitching looks like. Um, so at this stage, it's more about like get it done and show like convince the team basically like sell them on this idea that that I have that it works for the story and that it you know that everyone's on board for it. My heart. Um, I did like I said go practical with the shoes. Why did it pause? This is annoying to me. Let me try it on this. I'm sorry. I'm gonna cut in front of you. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, my horse this working yet? There we go. It's kind of just not work. That happens sometimes. I, it's just me painting a shoe. <laughs> There's nothing that interesting about it, but I did go practical with the shoes uh, because I, I've already said why it's, you know. Oh, also, I'm on the horse now. I'm just going to say it. Um, uh, I liked they, those shoes were just from those references. I saw them. I was like, those are practical. They're timeless. They work. I'm just going to use them. I'm not going to think too much about it. I, horse, this is the next part. <laughs> so uh, part of me painting this image was, of course, horse. Like that is what I love to do the most. And so I will, again, take every opportunity to do it. Um, but there is a like a design reason <laughs> for this. Um, th you know, I said she was going to be riding in on this thing. And a big part of that detailing was the cloak. And so I, I, in my mind, I wanted it draped across the back of the horse. So you could see the cloak, um, and you could see that detailing on it, because normally, you know, in most shots of people in films, you very rarely get like full body, like back shots. You get a lot of like mids and faces and stuff. And so when someone's riding in on a horse, you will absolutely get like a nice full shot, very dramatic with like the detailing and everything. And so it was that was the main consideration. It's like I want to show that. And so the whole point of this was really just to show off the cape. Um, and there's I could have just painted a cape from behind and like you know showed how it was gonna put on the detailing and I would probably do that as well like I'd probably do that as an aside especially if this got moved forward and approved but to me it's so much more impactful to pitch this narrative moment and this costume in this way because a creative director and the rest of the team who might not be artists themselves usually aren't could look at it and be like yeah it's a freaking cool cape on a horse I love it whereas if they're just looking at a cape they're like 
cave? <laughs> like, yeah, I don't really, I can't, I can't imagine it. Um, so <laughs> that's, uh, that's why I tend to work this way. And this way of working, the, the kind of the big question that I get mostly from other, um, uh, other artists that work professionally is, you know, a lot of places don't really kind of allow for that type of pipeline. But even if I were to pitch it as just the cape, I'm still thinking about the same stuff. This at the end of the day is just presentation. But all the thought that went into it is the exact same, whether I'm working on this game, this pipeline or some other pipeline. It's just funner to do it that way. Like, who wouldn't want to do it that way? <laughs> it's the best way to do it. Uh, so since I already had the costume designed, this version of painting her is really easy. I just color pick it right off. You can see me kind of like moving back and forth quickly. I've already sorted out the um, that value breakdown of that velvet. Um, so I still make sure to hit all of that on here. Um, so it just makes the entire process go a lot smoother. Uh, it's also, I don't know why I do this, I just do. Uh, I tend to make these images more stylized. I think it's because it is my comfort zone. Like I started as a much more stylized artist and then I moved into this more naturalistic space. So to me, this is just like, it, it be it's a little bit easier for me to get through a stylized image than it is for me to get into the more like super natural naturalistic space. Um, and also I like to work both ways, honestly. I'm gonna skip this, but I have a full playthrough of the horse video um, for when we're doing Q&A. Um, so this is getting into the detailing, which is the whole point of this painting <laughs> that I told you about. Um, so I've left it to the very end. I paint the entire base of this thing, although the horse isn't done. He's got some, some horse problems. There's horse anatomy issues with this that I fix later, so don't judge me too harshly if you're a horse person. But I start painting these things in because this is my idea. I told you originally it was like a top-down view of a river with lily pads on it. I start doing I'm like, these look like Pac-Man. Like, <laughs> my beautiful idea, my perfect idea. It's like, it's ruined. Um, so I was like, okay, well, I still like the idea. So like, how do I fix this? So I decided instead to do lily pads from below or from like a side view. So again, you have to be able to move. Like you have to be able to change. And uh, like I had painted this whole painting <laughs> and left this part to the end and I was like, fuck, like I hate this. Um, so then you, yeah, it's, it's about adapting. And there was a world where maybe this wouldn't work either. It's like, okay, well then now I have to figure something else out. There's also a world where the entire thing just doesn't work and I have to try something else. So it's about not being precious, finding new solutions. Like don't just settle for it. Don't just be like, it doesn't look, it looks like Pac-Man's, but I guess she's now a, like a, Pac-Man river god thing. So you have to kind of move and grow um, with it. That's important. Um. <laughs> so yeah, it was two costumes, it's not an arc. Correct my horrible inner critical voice. It's not. Um, however, like I mentioned with games, um, it's not as straightforward as you don't get a full script where you're like, I'm gonna plot out this whole costume from beginning to end. You do tend to go piece for piece. And you have to be able to like work back and like be like, okay, now this doesn't fit. Like, let's massage everything. Um, also, for learning this stuff, I actually think a simple two-point narrative is one of the easier ways to do this because once you start to get into the multi-costume arc, you're just adding complication. And I do think that's a thing to get into. But to start, just picking like, here's the hero costume, here's the costume for the next thing that happens, and then you go from there. Like, you can continue on and build out the rest of the costumes from this. I tend to, when I'm doing multiple costumes, I'll keep a sheet that has all of them on it, and it'll usually have the other characters as well. So like, I'll have Tom on here as well, and I look at them all together. I look at them as a whole, and ask myself, like, what is this even saying? Does this hit the notes that I'm trying to hit, and does it, you know, to me, adequately tell the story I'm trying to tell? And then how does that interplay with the other characters? And so you can imagine with a game like The Last of Us with as many characters as it had, that was a massive undertaking to try to make sure that not only did these have an interesting arc on their own, but that those arcs played with the other characters in a way that didn't have too much overlap. Like, so you weren't getting confused by the like 10 teenagers in Abby's group that all wear beige. Like you had to be able to like understand like that these are different people and that they're in those color palettes so that we kind of understand like, okay, that's Abby's group, but they're all very, very unique and you can tell them apart even though they're all wearing very, you know, contemporary, normal clothes, you still know who's who. Um, and you can tell who's who even at a distance from costuming. That's because of the amount of time that, you know, Ashley and the rest of the team put into planning this, like thinking this through and being very careful in those decisions. Um, 
So to recap, um, the first thing is you got to ask questions. So our purpose, um, oops, sorry, I read the wrong thing. Um, so uh, the first question that I already mentioned before is why are you doing it? Like, why are you changing the costume here? Does it need a, co a full costume change? Could you do an alteration to the existing costume? Like, why are you even doing it in the first place? Um, and then is it to show, like, the passage of time? Is that part of it? Like, has something happened in the story that necessitates the change? Um, also, an important one, are you foreshadowing something? So I showed you the Elliot one where he has the big puffy red jacket on. That foreshadows a later costume that has a huge impact on the narrative. So are you putting something into this costume that's sort of hinting at a thing that's to come in the future, which is a nice thing to think about. It's often something that you can, like, go back when you've done a bunch of them and be like, I'm going to add a little something here to, like, you know, hint at this thing that's coming up. What do you maintain? So you look back at the ones you've already designed and what do you think should stay consistent within them? Um, and what do you change and for what reason? You have to have a reason. And um, is it practicality? Is it personality? Like, it can't just be like, it's cool. Like, stuff can look cool. You can, you know, put stuff in that, like, is cool and interesting. But try to ask yourself, like, why would they do this? Why would the character put this on themselves? And personality cool is within personality so if they just wanted to put some cool shit on and it's their personality to do that absolutely that makes sense um, and then be willing to change which was the thing I mentioned with the the lily pads and with everything like it's a very fluid profession it's very much about adapting and, and moving with the flow of of all of this um, and then yeah recap it's one costume in a very short and very shallow arc but I hope from it you can see how you would extrapolate that out, how you would take that one sort of set of ideas that I presented and then take it and roll with it and do a bunch of different costumes and then be able to look at them all as a whole. Um, okay, so then I'm this is just the horse video again, so I'm going to let this run while we have questions, if any of you have questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do I choose what's the most important part? So, like, you're saying that there's a lot to put into it, but you're, like, weighing, like, what... Hmm. I don't really think... I don't, I don't think I usually think about, like, which part I would do first. I do tend to think about practicality, I think, more... Like, that's the first one that I think about. I'm sorry, let me get the freaking video to run because it's, it's annoying to me that this keeps pausing, and then I will answer that question better. Play this. Hopefully this runs. No, play. Maybe? Oh, it's right here. Okay. Um, you better work, damn it. <laughs> I hate you. I hate technology. Um, sorry. I think about practicality often, the first. So the b the easy one is like, is the weather changing? Like, is the time, of, like, is it just a time change? Are we trying to show like, oh, it's a time change? And then it's like, then you think back in your head, like, okay, like, what would the, if, if it was a weather thing, what would they change? So with Ellie, when the weather changed in Seattle, we just put a jacket on her. So then we designed out that jacket. Um, did that answer your question? Or are you saying like you wanted, so you're saying like if there's a bunch of complex things to add to the, the question, what's the most important part? God, I don't know. <laughs> I think that it depends on the character. Like I think that, again, if you go through that list of questions, it's going to be different for, for everyone. Like it's going to depend entirely on the questions. And so it's not easy to have like a clear plan with that. You have to look at every single one on their own. Like with her, the main thing I needed was to add that cape. Like I wanted the cape added um, and to add the, the heavier material to feel a certain way. So when you go down the checklist of like your, your questions about why you're doing it, that should reveal to you what is important about changing it. And then the way that I do that like paper doll thing where I like lay them out, if there's something like really out there that I want to try, it's easy to do it. If it's like, oh, I kind of want to add this like, you know, I want to put pants on her. It's like, okay, like, I'll just copy it out and I'll do a version that with pants on it and just see how it feels. So it's a very, like, there's no order to that. It's very, like, just sort of figuring it out as I go. And uh, as long as you're maintaining that foundation and those questions that you're asking yourself, um, it should plan it out for you. 
Is that a better question? Is there a better question? Okay. Sorry. Next one. Right here. Oh my God, Art, sta Art Station Marketplace. I love Art Station Marketplace. This reference pack is my favorite reference pack and I will share it with you all because I think it's the best reference pack that's ever been made. Um, it is, what is it called? It's called like Landshut Wedding or something like that. And it is like five folders of just people in like on horses in like crazy medieval garb. I'm like, what is this? It's a gift from the heavens. And it's like on this girl's gum road. So I'll post a link to that somewhere. But it, it's just look like it's called like L A N D S H U T wedding uh, reference photos. If you look that up, you're welcome. <laughs> welcome to the horse medieval gold mine. Hello. It depends. I'm a very quality over quantity person. So I know that some creative directors will be like, give me 20. And it's like, no, like you don't. First of all, you don't know what to do with 20. Like you don't know what you're, you're going to be confused or I'm going to get mad. You're going to be like, I don't like any. Like, no, you're fine with three. I get that if you just start, though, you can't really say that to your creative director. That probably takes a level of rapport. So sometimes they will ask for a bunch. And I try my best to just be like, how about we start with five? pick the ones you like, pick the ones you don't like, and then we go from there. Because that to me is a better use of time, just like churning out <laughs> ideas when you don't really feel strongly about them, to me only leads to more confusion, not just for them, but for you. Like, because I have a, a plan in my head and it deviates, like I give options, but it's like, for me to just start like shooting out like random stuff is like, I don't really feel strongly about any of these anymore. And then sometimes they pick the one that I've not put any thought into that I just throw like slap stuff on and it's like, oh God, what have I done? So um, I try three is my like golden number, five, sure. When they start asking for more, I'm like, you're just indecisive. Let's start with, let's start with five and then we'll like go from there. Yes. Thank you. Sure. That's a really good question. So I do look a lot at a lot of historical stuff, um, but in a lot of the work that I've been doing, I don't want it to adhere to a specific time, particularly fantasy stuff. Like fantasy stuff does not have an era that corresponds with ours. So I looked at Regency a lot for her original costume design. Um, and I love the look. I love the look of like that really high waist with a very flowing gauzy um, look. But I was very careful to also look at modern dresses. So I'll just go on Pinterest and look at like, you know, current modern clothing, uh, the type of cuts that are used there, and I blend them. Um, and it's specifically to avoid dating it to a specific time period. That's important for fantasy. If I was doing a historical piece, I would 100% dedicate, like just zone in on like, what are the cuts? And I have books from like the Victorian era's like cuts. Like I have like this book of like, all the different patterns of like um, how they made dresses then. So I would call Claire Hummel and be like, hello, please help me. Um, and <laughs> I would dive into really historical stuff and I would try my best to adhere to that. But there, you know, most, a lot of people complain about, you know, how things don't adhere exactly to um, those historical times. Sometimes those garments just don't end up looking good on, on film and like uh, in, in the costuming and they have to make those adjustments. So you do have to weigh all these considerations, but 100% if I was doing something historical, I'd be like, yes, let's like get right into looking at all the historical costuming books. And I do think it's important to have, if not like in your mind already, just start to save reference and buy books and stuff like that that you can look at. Um, I also highly recommend there is this book. It's very, someone posted it on Twitter. It's like this big and it's called like the Encyclopedia of Fashion or some of that. And it's like little line drawings of like every type of shoe and like every cut of jacket. And I got it like, where did we get that? We like ordered it online, but it was like, it looks like those morpho, like those really simple line drawings, which I love that. I love when it's a very simple drawing and I can look at it and be like, oh, okay, I got that's what that type of shoe looks like. So I have that book, it's like on my desk. And when I'm like, I know 
in my mind what I want this jacket to look like, but I don't remember the actual name of it. I just open that and I look at it and I'm like, there it is, riding habit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so at not oh God, <laughs> I got so excited. <laughs> uh, at Naughty Dog, we d we did do that. We spent a, like I'd say that we spent the most amount of time with those characters. Like we were in their heads constantly, and that at least at Naughty Dog, and I don't think it's like this everywhere. But we did design the characters as well. Like we, you know, went through the casting process. It was primarily Ashley, like would look through casting calls to find like the exact right face to match these people and all that stuff. So we were very much involved in the character design as well, but also in the characterization, like you said. Um, because we're sitting there designing like every element, like I spent days on the little um, keychain that Dina has on her backpack, and I would sit there and think like, well, where did she get it? Um, and like, why would she pick it up? And like, what most represents her at the moment that she would have gotten it and stuff like that? Is there a way to make it so that it's like, oh, a friend gave it to her or something? Like we got into like Joel's mug. Joel's mug took like, I don't know, like a week, two weeks <laughs> to design the mug of Joel, like because it's like, you know, it has to feel Joel, but also not be too, you know, not stand out too much and um, not be too like on the nose. So it's that like owl, it's like an owl drawing or something. So we get very into the characterization to the point where like I wrote some dialogue for the um, museum scene for Ellie because I was so like in their head. Um, so yes, uh, to me, especially with how technology is moving right now, I think that the more that we can, as concept artists, get involved in that element of it, in the writing and the storytelling, and like, you know, th that that part of like building these characters up, I think that just is better for us as a whole. I think it's more rewarding um, than because I've done all the types of concept. I've also done the, what was it? <laughs> oh, it's because he's emo. He looked really emo, and I put that in for my coworker. It's that Blink 182 song. She's. She sings it to us um, anytime someone asks in a meeting, like where someone's at on a on a piece. Where are you? Uh, so I put that in for her. Cause look how emo he looks here. The horse needed work here. I was like, I, yeah, I fix them later. But um, <laughs> sorry, I got so distracted. But uh, yeah, I think that g get in, like even if you know your pipeline doesn't allow for that, I think it's good exercise for us. We are a part of the the characterization of these people and we are trying to breathe life into these you know mo these 3d models um and it's good practice for us to to get more into the writing part of it and to really you know start thinking about that more because even if we can't in our jobs get that stuff in there it does push us to think about things in a more narrative way in our designs and so even if it's not getting in directly it's going to get in subtly through the, the stuff that we pitch and the choices that we make um so yeah we were able to, but I don't know that works that way everywhere. Uh, next question. Yes, Hunter. Yeah. Hell yeah, iconic. <laughs> yes. Ooh, yes. Do I ever. There is a website. Let me think. I don't have. I'm going to check my phone real quick and see if I can find it right now for you. It has every Sears and JC Penny catalog going back to 1940. I was looking at like Littlest Pet Shop page from 1997. I was like, oh my God, take me back. I want to go back to that time. Um, let me, did that just put what was on my phone on it? No, okay. I was like, <laughs> God. There's noth it's nothing. It's probably a picture of a horse to be honest. <laughs> but, um, Okay, let me see if I can find it for you really fast. Someone, I'll, I'm gonna look for this and someone else ask another question while I do it so we're not just standing here while I look at my phone. Um, yes. Yeah, no, it will come.
yeah oh my god i spend the most time in the research phase i actually spend the least amount of time possible in the drawing phase um i will research i will do the entire like plan out what i want to do think i write it i do more writing than drawing if i'm being honest i have a notebook that's just writing um which i don't think you all have to do but it's, it's how i approach it um, or i'll do like a notion board and i'll like type out all the plans that i have um, and then the next step is i'll make I don't really make mood boards anymore because I, I, I kind of just keep, you know, I have my reference and I just start mixing these parts together. But for your purposes, you can make a mood board where you start to think about, like, what are things that are inspiring me right now that I could start to, like, are st in that same vein. I'll also sometimes do that to know what to avoid. So, like, I'll look at other people's art that I like and I'll put it in the mood board as a reminder, like, I don't want to tread on this. Like, I don't want to, like, redo something that's already been done. I want it to be unique. Um, and then the next stage, once I have a very clear idea of what I want to do, then I gather reference and I will get every piece of reference that I need before I start. And like you saw, I put it all around the thing. Sometimes I still have to go, like sometimes I'll get halfway through painting, I'm like, I need a new reference for this. Like I did it for the horse's bridle. Um, that happens, that's normal. But most of my reference is gathered and ready. I've got the idea, it is just drawing to me, and I'm sure some of you feel the same, is sometimes just a painful process. Like drawing and painting it remains painful forever. Like I d I someday, maybe it's going to not feel painful, but for now it's like there is, and I do get a lot of joy. I got a lot of joy out of painting this, this painting, but I reduce the pain as much as possible. <laughs> and so I will trace stuff and I will put my reference everywhere and I do not just try to guess what it looks like out of my head if I can because that just cuts the pain down by like two thirds. And then it's just smooth sailing and you can feel good about the process. Like you can feel confident because you've prepared yourself and you're like, I know, I know what I'm doing. Like I can, I can do this, I have it planned out. Whereas when I'm just going, like if I just sit there and sketch and go for it, I'm like, I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. My head's like in a million different directions. Um, any other questions? Yes, back there, I saw you first. Yes. Uh huh. No, absolutely use photos. Use photo. Use photo bashing. I think that um, I actually have to use photo bashing for a project coming up, and I'm like, oh no, I'm not that good at that. Um, it's a very hard skill <laughs> to be able to photo bash really well. Um, I just paint like this because I, uh, you know, I'm also a traditional painter. And I just like it. So if I can find a way to enjoy <laughs> the thing that I'm doing while I have to do it for work, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Uh, so I absolutely recommend using photo bashing. Um, and it's a fantastic way, especially if material reads are important to your production pipeline. It makes it go really fast. Not, I am nothing is below us <laughs> in production art, like other than stealing other people's work. That is bullshit. I'm not gonna take someone else's work. I try like would never take someone's art photography and like just throw it onto my piece. I think that's bullshit. Um, but I do trace stock photos and I do you know use 3D all the time. If there's if there is a hard edge in something I'm doing, I am not plotting perspective. I will not do it. Like I will <laughs> model, I have modeled the dumbest shit out in Blender that like I should absolutely be able to, I should probably be able to do it faster just by hand, but I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. I don't feel like it, so. Yes. Yeah. Sure, that's a really good question. Oh my goodness, I hope that I've not done that in any of the things that I've done. Um, most of the time when I'm looking for a reference, I'm looking for something very specific. So I get the idea in my head and then it's like, I have a very specific garment in mind even that I'm looking for. So when it comes to the actual cuts and the fits and everything, like if I am going to go for something that is from a different culture, I've planned that out and I'm not just gonna like piecemeal and be like, I'm just gonna pull this piece from, you know, this Japanese culture and then I'm gonna pull this thing from a Native American. I'm like, that's not really how I work because I do have, like I will look for, even if I'm bashing them together, I'll be like I'm looking for a Regency style dress. And so it's like that kind of, you, when you search for that stuff, you're gonna find very specific types of things. When it comes into designing cultural stuff, like, like when you're designing characters from different cultures, the 
best thing that you can do is just do as much research as possible, but I think you should be doing as much research as possible for every one of these costumes. So you should never, I think when people fall into that trap is when they just move ahead and they're like, oh, whatever, I'm just gonna throw feathers on it and stuff like that. It's like, okay, but that like, why are you putting the feathers on it? Like, what does it mean? What's your purpose behind it? So you will naturally avoid that stuff when you're pre-planning like this, when you're really thinking through like, the cho every choice you're making has a reason and is saying something about this character, then you're not gonna do that. You're not just gonna randomly toss things on. Like every detail down to the type of embroidery I'm putting on is thought through. And so even that is reference. And I'm when you're looking for the reference, then it's easy to look up like, what is the significance of this? And there's a lot of symbolism that can mean a lot of things, stuff that I know I don't know about. So if I'm using a very specific symbol, like if I find like, like this is a cool looking symbol, I, I like reverse Google image search and I'm like, this better not be like a fascism thing or something. Like, it was like, I don't like that. So like, I will do that. Like if I'm gonna use something directly, which is pretty rare, but I will cross reference it for that very reason. Cause like, I want it to say something specific. I don't want it to just be arbitrary. And I think those mistakes come from being arbitrary. Did that answer your question? Okay, good, good. Y yes, you, I, you had your hand up. I use the Kyle Webster brushes, um, but also I like the Maxi Lichney ones. I have used the same brushes. I've used the same, like, I think five brushes for the past, like, 10 years. It's like Mary Blair gouache 30, Mary Blair gouache 70, and then there's, like, a dry brush texture. Are we, am I over time? <gasps> I am by 10 minutes. Do you need me to leave? <laughs> Okay, yeah, we can wrap it up. I'm so sorry. I got very, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm going to find that. I promised you all that ref, the, the catalog thing. I'm going to find it on my phone, and I'm going to give it to you outside. Thank you all so much. <laughs>